All right, hello everyone. Can you hear me okay all the way in the back? Sound good? All right, great. Thanks for coming. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, basic app development with, with Swift. Um, get started here. So before we get started, I'd just like to talk a little bit about myself because that's why I'm up here. But uh, uh, I work for a company called Pivotal, and uh, we do a lot of uh, stuff related to the cloud and, and fun stuff like that. But uh, today I'm just kind of here on my own time to talk about Swift. Um, I have been a, a longtime Mac user. I started, uh, I think our first Mac was a, an Apple IIe, so it's way back. And uh, yeah, that was the first computer I started programming. And so I've been, you know, kind of working with them for a long time now. Um, I've uh, kind of grown into being a professional software developer. And uh, why I started playing with Swift was because I just felt a need to kind of write some custom apps, you know, for my laptop. Just small things I couldn't find, uh, you know, in the app store that I wanted it to do. And so I just said, hey, I think I can do this. And so I started looking at Swift. And, uh, you know, this talk's going to be uh, about Swift, but, you know, I, I'm coming at it from, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of what I've learned as I was going through. I'd like to share those lessons and kind of maybe save you guys some of the pain that I had to go through to learn this stuff. So I'm not an expert at Swift. I'll try to answer any questions you have, but you could, pro you could very well stump me. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, I'll just kind of run through a little bit of an introduction about Swift. We'll uh, talk about the language, maybe spend, um, I don't know, maybe about 20, 25 minutes on that. And then uh, we'll kind of talk about Xcode, because if you're going to write apps, you really need to know Xcode too. And if you've used that before, you know, doing Objective-C, um, you know, you should be kind of familiar with it already. And a lot of those skills will transfer over uh, into what you do with Swift. Uh, beyond that, I want to talk about uh, some of the libraries, you know, to, that, that you'll probably want to use to do some cool stuff like... Uh, you know, making, you know, requests to web services and, uh, you know, reading JSON and looking at the file system, you know, doing the kind of stuff that you're going to want to do with your apps. And then we'll kind of close up with some, uh, you know, steps on where you can go next to, to keep your, keep your, uh, keep going with Swift. All right. So as I was saying before, uh, the kind of the goals of this talk are just a, a nice, gentle introduction show you the tools, show you, you know, what, uh, you know, how to get started. Um, I'm not going to show you everything about Swift. You know, there's, there's really good documentation, um, you know, that walks through all the finer points. I'm going to try to focus on some of the basic things that you're going to need to know just to start writing an app. Um, you know, you don't have to know all the, the, hot, the, the, the crazy concepts and, and classes and all that stuff just to write an app. You know, you, you can get quite far with, with a small amount of Swift. Uh, some of the things that are out of scope, um, iOS development, it's not something I've done. I'm really just focusing on writing apps for your desktop, you know, for, for the Mac OS. Um, you know, and again, I'm not going to promise you're going to walk out of here a master of any of this stuff, but, you know, if you've never touched it before, yeah, I'd hope to, this will help you get started. And then lastly, I I'm not going to talk about, you know, Swift 2 yet or uh, Xcode 7. I, uh, I was not brave enough to install that on my laptop before the presentation, so um, <laughs> I kind of stayed away from it for now. But I think that uh, a lot of the things that they're doing with that are iterative, so learning, uh, you know, the, the stuff from Swift 1.2, you know, you should be able to progress to 2, you know, fairly easily once that stuff gets more stable. So to get started, you know, you obviously need to Xcode. Um, I, I'm pretty sure you guys can all handle installing that. Uh, I've been uh, working mostly with Yosemite and, and Xcode 6.3. Uh, when I first started working on the presentation, I was still on, on Maverick. And um, if, if you're still on that, it's okay. You can do some stuff with Swift, but it's a little bit limited because the Xcode version is a little bit older. So uh, you, you're not going to get quite all of the stuff that you want from Swift. So I had to upgrade just because uh, I was finding things weren't compiling the way I wanted. So you might be in the same boat if you're still on Mavericks as well. Um, and then a couple optional tools. Um, 
these are really for installing third-party libraries and it, it just it makes your life a lot easier. Uh, the first one is, is Carthage. It's kind of a command line tool that you can use. You just uh, define the libraries you want and the version numbers in a file and then it will just go out, download everything, build it, and basically give you the, the framework file that you can pull into your projects. Uh, CocoaPods is very similar. Um, it's a little bit more automated. So, uh, talking about Swift here, um, it's a compiled language. Uh, so, y you know, you, you make your changes and then, you know, when you save Xcode, it very nicely will just automatically compile that for you. You'll see a little bit of a lag as it compiles stuff, but um, I'm sure that'll get faster, you know, as, uh, as they get better with the compiler. Um, it's a statically typed language. It's statically strongly typed language. So, um, you get a lot of nice uh, features in, the, in, in Xcode because it's statically typed and they can do things like um, the infer types from, you know, from your, your statements and things like that. And also, um, you know, the fact that it's, it's strongly typed, if, if you're not familiar with that concept, basically means once you, once you assign a type to a variable, it's going to have that type. And so there's a lot of optimizations and things they can do, you know, because it's static and strongly typed. Um, that just kind of, uh, you know, help the language be a little bit faster, you know, when they compile down the bytecode. Um, it, uh, you know, I think part of what I've read about it, the, the intent is for it to be kind of more concise and safer and uh, more robust than obje object C, Objective-C. Um, I don't know if, if that's necessarily true or not, but uh, th I, that's kind of the intent on what they're going for. Um, I think the language is, uh, from my opinion, a lot nicer to look at than, than Objective-C. I'm sure if you're an Objective-C guy, you know, you'd probably prefer that. But, um, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as they say. So um, the nice thing about Swift, though, is that it's not, a, it's not an extra layer that sits on top of Objective-C. It, it is its own language. And um, when you compile, it's not you know, compiling to Objective-C and then doing something crazy like that. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's using LLVM and, and compiling right to, you know, native binaries, you know, for your machine. So, you know, there isn't really a performance impact to using Swift or anything like that. Um, and all the libraries work beautifully with it. You know, there isn't like, you know, this whole complete set of, of libraries you need to learn to use Swift. If you've used Coco, you know, before, you're going to be familiar with how it works in, in Swift. You know, there's slightly different syntax for how you, you know, access properties and things like that. But, um, you know, you can transfer a lot of those skills. Um, yeah, as I said, it, it works great. You know, you can access Objective-C code if you've got existing libraries that are written in it. Um, they'll play very well, you know, with, with Swift. Same thing with C. You know, you can access C code, you know, from it too. And um, I think uh, more... Recently, this was added to Objective C2, but um, it basically has, you know, for memory management, it, it does a, um, uh, what's that stand for? ARC is, um, it's basically re resource counting. So it, it will automatically count the, the, the number of uh, instances that are using objects, and then, you know, when those are done being used, it'll automatically free them up. Uh, it's, it's fairly simple to work with from a developer standpoint, and, you know, it works for most cases. There are, there are some corner cases where, you know, you have to think about memory management a little bit, but, but by and large, it, it frees you from having to do that. Uh, Apple's got some great docs on Swift. Uh, you know, I've got some links here, uh, so if you want to, you know, grab the slides later and kind of, uh, you know, go through those, you can find, you know, a lot of the, the, the finer details and uh, that stuff. Um, I also like the, 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 the Swift Tour. Um, it's a, a playground file that uh, Apple has that you can kind of go through and just, you know, play with the language. And I'll show some more of that uh, in a little bit here. So playgrounds, um, if, if you haven't heard about those, it's uh, something new that was added to Xcode uh, for Swift. And uh, basically what it is is, uh, it's an environment that you can, uh, you know, write your Swift code in, and as you're writing it, it's going to evaluate the stuff for you. So you can kind of go through line by line and see what, 
what's happening. So it's a great place to do things like, you know, proto prototype new code or, or play with something, um, you know, that you're trying to learn, you know, investigate an API, you know, something like that. It also works with the GUI classes. So you can like kind of use it to design your views and things like that. Um, I, I found it to be great. Um, it was, it's a little buggy in some of the releases, but, uh, you know, by and large, it, it was very, a nice tool to have, very helpful for learning. Uh, so that would be something that I would highly suggest playing with. Uh, and hopefully, as we'll see here, it's a great tool for presentations as well. Uh, so testing, um, you know, you always want to test your code. That's it, kind of an important tenant of things. Um, you, you know, doing that with Swift is, is you know, just like any other language, um, it's uh, built on top of the, the XC test case, which um, I believe is also used by Objective-C, but don't, don't quote me on that. Um, and uh, you, you can you write all your unit tests in Xcode. There's lots of convenient little uh, uh, ways that you can run them. You know, you can run the whole test, you can run a test suite, you can run individual tests, um, you know, which is really convenient, allows you to kind of focus in on, you know, that one particular part of your code that you're trying to make work right. Um, the only kind of issue that I found while I was writing some tests is that, um, at least at the moment, the, the code that you're writing in, in your main project, uh, I'm sorry, in your main target is separate from your test code, which is in a separate target. And so when you try to access, like, uh, a property of, of one of the classes that you've declared or, or something like that, it's, unless those are public, you won't see them in your tests. And so it can be a little bit difficult to, um, you know, test things or at least uh, evaluate that your tests are working properly because you don't have that, uh, I guess, insight into what's going on behind the scenes. You know, so if you've got a class that has some state, it's a little bit difficult to say, you know, run a method and then check that state unless it's public, which a lot of times it won't be. Um, I, I guess that's been a pain that a lot of people have felt. And I, I heard something about that being fixed with Swift 2.0, uh, that they had kind of added a way to make that easier. So it's not all uh, sunshine and roses. Um, Swift is still, it's very new. It's moving at a, uh, a pretty rapid pace, um, which is nice. So, you know, when you do hit stuff, it tends to get fixed fairly quickly. But, um, you know, I, I've heard reports of people hitting compiler bugs, things like that, that they've had to work around. Uh, I didn't hit anything like that myself, but, um, you know, it's something to keep in mind as you're evaluating it for new projects. You know, you, you could hit a bug with it and, you know, it could set you back a little bit time wise. Um, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, I, when I was using uh, Mavericks, I had to upgrade to Yosemite because Mavericks only supports a Swift 1.1. And so I was using some third party projects uh, for the demos and we'll see that later. And the authors of those projects were using Swift 1.2. So, I couldn't compile their code unless I had upgraded. And so you kind of get into some situations like that. And so I think for at least a little while, it's going to be one of those things where you're going to have to, if you're, if you're working with Swift, you're going to have to keep up with the Xcode updates and the, the OS updates so that you can get uh, all that latest, all the latest goodies. Um, the only other thing I guess I would mention is that, uh, you know, when you're, when you're going through the docs, um, you know, Apple's been pretty good about adding examples uh, that are written in Swift, so you can see, you know, how to use APIs and things like that. But depends on, you know, what what you're really digging into. Um, you know, I, there were there were quite a few I found that still didn't have examples in Swift. And um, so, if you're not familiar with Objective C, you might have to get at least kind of a cursory overview of it so that you can read the examples and understand roughly what they're doing and then kind of learn how to convert that to Swift. Um, I had never, you know, looked at Objective-C or written a line of it before, and it, it wasn't really that hard to, you know, just kind of pick enough out of it that you could convert the examples to Swift. So after a little while, you know, you can just pick that up. Uh, and then the other thing is that, like, there's not a ton of resources available right now. Um, Stack Overflow has uh, quite a few posts, but 
it's uh, it's kind of weird. You know, with as new as Swift is, the information is still kind of dated. Um, you know, you'll see a lot of posts in Stack Overflow that are talking about like beta versions and things like that. And some of the information is relevant, some of it's not. Sometimes the, the the authors on those questions, you know, were nice enough to come back and update them for you know more recent versions. Sometimes not. So it's just something that you kind of have to be careful with when you're reading through that stuff. Um, as far as uh, Xcode instability, um, I've <laughs> I've had a lot of fun with that. Uh, the playground feature for uh, probably for a couple months was was pretty rough. It would crash Xcode a couple times an hour, um, which was hard. <laughs> but uh, it it actually got quite a bit better with the last updates, and I, I haven't seen it crash on me uh, probably in the last month or so. So um, they're getting my bug reports. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I found this uh, this awesome website. You know, if you're if you're ever working with Xcode and feeling a little bit frustrated. Just check it out. There's there's some funny posts here. I, I I pulled my favorite one. I don't know if you guys can read that in the back. Uh, he he has all the posts on that website formatted as text conversations from Xcode. So he he's talking to. You, he says, "How many elements are in that dictionary?" Xcode says, "Some." Seriously, how many, man? Uh, seriously, some. He's like, "It's got to be like three or four. Just tell me." Listen, this dictionary is declared optional, right? Yeah, so well, I'm opting out of counting it. <laughs> so, and then he's actually got a screenshot here where where you can see the the output of it, and it just says sum. <laughs> so, it kind of helps when you're banging your head against the wall to get a little humor. All right, so with that, uh, I'm gonna show a little bit of Swift here. Uh, so these are the, the playgrounds that I was talking about. And one of the cool things about playgrounds for you know presentations and for training materials is that you can embed um, basically comments and documentation in them. And so uh, when you, I can show this at the end if we have extra time, but you basically use a markdown uh, like language and then you can uh, you know add nice comments like this and, and additional information. I'm not gonna go through a ton of this stuff because you know I don't want to bore you guys, but it's it's here for later. So when you come back and you want to look through, you know, I tried to add some you know nice comments and, and information like that. Um, you know, just start at the top. You know, the the thing that every uh, language talk has to show is you know hello world. Um, in a in a traditional app, you'd call print line, but actually in in a playground, you can just do hello world. And that will work too. You, know, you see over here on the right, um, because the way it does the the read eval print loop, whatever you know, whatever the value of that line is, it's going to show on the right here. So we don't necessarily have to print it to see it, which can come in handy you know, as you're as you're going through your code. We'll see that later. Um, in Swift, you've got two basic ways that you can uh, store data. You, you've got constants and variables, and um, constants are declared with let, and variables are declared with var. Uh, the official recommendation is to use constants whenever possible, because the compiler can optimize those more. And so the more constants you can use, the, the better it can optimize your code, the faster things are going to run. Um, as you can see, even though this is a strongly typed language, we don't have to declare our types. Uh, we, it, the, the compiler is smart enough to infer them. So it sees this 42 and it knows that it's an integer, so the type is automatically set accordingly. Um, so that's kind of a nice feature that lets your code be a little more, um, uh, a little less verbose. Uh, if you do want to declare types, you're, you're welcome to. Um, it's uh, de depending on what languages you're familiar with, uh, it may seem a little bit backwards. You know, a lot of the traditional C languages, the type comes first and then the, the variable name, but uh, in Swift, it's you know, variable name, colon, and then the type. Uh, you know, again, um, you know, printing stuff, you know, a lot of times you're going to want to take the value of something and inject that into uh, a very, uh, into, a, you know, what you're printing out. You know, 
you want to see the value of this variable, something like that. And uh, Swift makes that easy. You can use this backslash and uh, parentheses syntax to um, uh, basically, you know, insert a variable here. Uh, and you can even you can even do stuff in there, you know. So I can say like, you know, plus twenty, and uh, the out the uh, output of that, yeah, you know, you'll see that actually does the math. Um, the the one thing that you can't do within these is access uh, dictionaries. So if you have a dictionary of objects, there's no way to say, um, uh, you know, I, I want the, you know, such and such key of that dictionary. It, uh, for whatever reason, it, it's just not part of the, the syntax that it allows, um, which can be a little annoying at times, but uh, it's easy enough to work around. Um, Swift's got a lot of support for uh, uh, collections, and um, it's, it's pretty comparable to like what you'd see in languages like Python or, or JavaScript. You know, you've got a nice, um, you know, brief syntax for, uh, you know, literal lists and things like that, which you can see here. Um, by default, you know, the list is going to be, uh, it's going to be typed, you know, so everything in that list is going to have the same type. Um, but you can actually assign it the, the any type, and then it can basically have anything. So in this case, you know, we're mixing a string, a number, uh, a list of stuff and you know another number <laughs> dictionaries same way uh, nice you know literal syntax that you know lets you create them you know very easily um, and uh, same uh, typing uh, stuff applies there as well uh, and then this is this is what I was talking about before about uh, if you want to print the value you know from a dictionary you have to grab that first and then print it um, there's just there's no way to uh, do that all kind of in one step So, uh, you know, you're obviously, when you're writing your code, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have more than just, a, you know, a, a sequential uh, step of things you want to do. Um, you know, Swift makes that easy with, uh, has a nice control flow. Um, you know, you've got uh, various different forms of loops. Uh, kind of the preferred form is, is for in. And, um, you know, you just give it a list and you say for in my list. And then, you know, it's going to give you that, uh, list of uh, values. If we expand this, you can see it's just going to loop through. Um, you can use the enumerate method if you want to get uh, kind of like a counter for that list. So you want to say, uh, you want to get like the, uh, the instance of that, which one it is. So you can see, you know, we've show up over here. Yeah, you know, so we can see that the, the first element in the list, which starts at zero, you know, is number one. And then uh, how that corresponds. You've also got the traditional C syntax for 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 loops. Um, I don't think that's as preferred, but there you know there are a couple times where it's just more convenient to do it that way. Uh, looping through a dictionary is is also pretty easy. Uh, you just gives you two arguments instead of one, and uh, you know the first one's the key, the second one's the value. Uh, you can also do, uh, if you're trying to iterate over, you know, say a, a range, uh, you know, you want to sum all the numbers from 1 to 100, um, you know, there's a nice, uh, you know, you can do it C style, you know, uh, the, the old way, uh, but you can also use uh, this nice uh, range syntax that Swift has. So, you know, you can do um, dot, 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 or uh, dot, 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 or, I'm sorry, dot, dot, less than. Uh, and then that, that kind of gives you the control whether it's inclusive or exclusive of that last number. Conditionals, uh, the syntax for, for, uh, for that's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, again, very similar to other you know, C-style languages with uh, your um, curly brackets. Um, there's a uh, kind of addition to that that uh, Swift gives you through optionals. And we'll talk about that in a second, but before we can talk about that, you kind of have to know what optionals are. And so in Swift, an optional is kind of the way that they uh, help fight against the, the old you know, null pointer errors and, and things like that. Um, you know, in, in typical languages like C, you know, an object's got a null value or nil, so a lot of times what you have to do before you can access that, you have to check and make sure it's not null or not nil, make sure it's got a value. And so 
instead of you know making you do those explicit checks all over the place, um, Swift gives you this optionals functionality. And so you can declare a variable as optional. And uh, the way you do that is just with this um, question mark at the end of the, the declaration. And then essentially what that'll say is this variable might have a value and it might not. And um, when you go to access it, then Swift will give you some uh, other ways to handle that. So you know, if we look down here, you can you can do the you know the traditional you know is this nil and compare against that. Um, you can also uh, um, use the exclamation point to basically just say give me the value, um, and uh, essentially. Um, the difference between an optional and a regular, if, if you look here, we're just printing this value. You'll see on the side it says optional, and then that's the value. Let's say we change this here to like to nil. You can see how stuff changes. So, you know, this standard check works just like you'd expect. Um, but instead of seeing that optional, you know, we've just got nil. And if you try to force it and say, hey, give me that value, it's just going to do nothing. And so that line won't evaluate. You don't get an error, it just won't evaluate. Um, getting back to the conditionals, where optionals come into play there is that part of the conditional, you can use this uh, let syntax. And if you say let, you know, whatever you want to call this value, and then you say you give it an optional, if that optional is set, so if it's got a value, it's going to assign that to name, and then it's going to run this code. If this optional isn't set, if it's nil, nothing happens. That whole block's going to skip. So you can use these um, optionals to kind of, uh, you know, guard, you know, certain sections, and you don't have to to do all these null checks. So if I switch this back, you can see here now. Now that we have a value, it's going to actually run this code, and we're going to get that there. You know, we could have, you know, 20 lines of stuff that it's doing here. You know, that whole section would get skipped, you know, if, if this isn't set. And uh, again, just to kind of reiterate, it's it's very similar to what you would do in, in a lot of other languages where you're, you know, explicitly checking, you know, to make sure that's set. It's just uh, kind of a nicety in the language where you don't have to do that. So, you know, I mentioned before, you know, there's, you don't have to necessarily know everything about Swift to write some apps. Um, one of the things that you definitely need to have a, a, a pretty good understanding on, though, are, are functions and closures. And um, the reason for that is because, you know, when you're, when you're putting your apps together and you say, you know, you add a button, you want that button to do something. So, you know, you're going to tell Xcode, all right, when the, when the user clicks that button, I want you to run this function or I want you to run this closure. And, you know, so you kind of have to have an understanding of how that works in Swift. And you might be thinking, what's a closure or how is that different than a function? And, you know, for, for practical purposes, they're, they're not really that different. Um, it's, uh, you can kind of think about them the same way if you're not, if you're not totally familiar. Um, it's essentially closures just give you a different way to, to declare a function. Um, you can think of them, I think, kind of as an, an anonymous function, so like a function without a name. Um, so in this case, you can see the syntax for, uh, for creating a function. You know, so you've got your name here, your parameters here, and then this is the return type. Um, functions can have multiple return types, if you like, which is kind of cool. It gives you some nice flexibility. Um, and uh, let's see here. Right, here's just calling it. Uh, you can also pass functions, which is uh, kind of a really cool feature once you get the hang of it a little bit. So you can take you know a function and then send that to another function, and that that other function will invoke it. And you're like, well, why would you do that? Why wouldn't that function just have the the logic there? The nice part about that is that it lets you kind of plug in that functionality. So if you're writing a library, that library doesn't know how to do, doesn't know how, have to know how to do something, it can have that functionality injected into it. And so, you know, it can do what it does, say, make a web request, and then take the functionality on what to do with that web request in, uh, as kind of a parameter to that function. 
So there's some really cool things you can do with that once you kind of get the hang of it. Um, closures, as we'll see here, are uh, very similar. Um, this is kind of a, a comparison here. You can see this is basically declaring a, a factorial uh, function. And then this is the exact same thing, but using a closure. So the syntax is a little bit different. Uh, in this case, um, we're not giving it a name. We're defining the closure here. And then that's getting assigned to this variable. So the variable then has that, like a, a reference to that uh, closure. And you can actually see when you look at it, uh, it's the same thing, that the type is a function. Um, so there, there's very practically, you know, the way that you can think about it if you're if you're not sure is they're basically the same thing. Um, some more examples of this. Um, so this is kind of uh, can, kind of emphasizes the point of what I was talking about. This map function um, it takes a function as a parameter, and what it does is it, it applies that function to every item in a collection. So in this case, we have our list of numbers, and we want to double them. So we pass in this double function, and it injects that functionality into map. Map runs through, runs that function on each item in here for us, and you know, nice and uh, we get our result here with the, the doubled values. Um, the closures where they're nice is when you are passing in small, uh, small things like that. You know, in this case, do I really want to declare a function double? Uh, it's pretty small. It doesn't really have a lot to it. Um, maybe I'm never going to use it again. It's just a one-off thing. But now I've got this function that's defined. It's taking up, you know, the name. So closures, what they allow you to do is to create that kind of on the fly, uh, anonymously. You know, there's no name associated with it. The only thing that's going to happen is this closure is going to get defined and injected into map. Once map's done and run, that's gone. There's, you know, it's not around anymore or anything like that. So it's good for, you know, injecting kind of one-off behavior and things like that. So this really uh, about, about it, I would say, in terms of kind of the basics of Swift that you need to know to write apps. And you know, we'll kind of see later in some of the examples, you know, where you're using this stuff. But um, there's a lot more to Swift. You know, it's, it's a full-featured language. Um, you know, it has classes and uh, interfaces and, and all that good stuff that, you know, that you want in a language. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the playground tour that Apple has is a lot more comprehensive than the one I put together here, and it walks through all that stuff. So I, I would really encourage you guys to take a look at that. And uh, it, it's also, I think it'll, you'll, you'll kind of fall in love with the playgrounds as well when you do look at it, because it lets you see the examples, but not only see them, you can adjust them and you can tweak them and say, okay, well, what happens if I do this or change this? And so it, it really makes um, for an interactive way to, to learn the language. Okay, so this may be review for some people, you know, if you've got some experience with Xcode, but uh, I'm going to kind of go through some of the ba basics of Xcode. And the perspective I'm coming from here is I've never, I, prior to this, I had never used Xcode. So a lot of this stuff was new to me. And even just kind of orienting myself in the utility, it was a little tricky at first, just figuring out where stuff was, what it does, that sort of thing. So, um, I just want to kind of run through some, you know, high level points on where you're going to find stuff, how to navigate around, you know, what's useful for building your apps. So when you fire up Xcode, you know, it's got this kind of typical paned uh, look of an IDE. And on the left hand side, you know, you'll see your nav bar. That's going to let you do things like browse through your project, uh, search for code, look at uh, the, the unit tests that you've written, things like that. Uh, you've got in the middle here in the blue, is uh, kind of your, uh, your your workplace. You know, this is where um, all the magic happens. You know, you're you're creating your uh, layouts, you're uh, writing your code, uh, all that good stuff. On the right is kind of what they call your utilities pane, and that has kind of all your your ancillary stuff. So you can see at the bottom here. You know, you've got the list of components, you know, so if I wanted to add a component, you know, I can search through here and try to find that component. Um, you know, at the top, you know, I've got 
various pieces of information about whatever I've selected here. Um, and then there's, you know, uh, kind of a slew of other, you know, different windows that you can click through here. And we'll look at those actually in Xcode in a bit. But um, it's, it's a handy place for lots of info. And then at the bottom, you've got your debug window. So, you know, when you run your app, if you're print lining something, you know, that output's going to show up in here. Um, you can also, uh, you'll also see, you know, the debugger. You know, if you insert breakpoints, uh, you'll see, you know, your, um, you know, the, the current set of variables. You'll see, you know, your controls for stepping through code, things like that. Uh, one of the f important things, because screen real estate is precious, is you know how to toggle those on and off. And you'll see over in the upper right corner uh, are some toggles for that. And so you know, unless you're debugging code or running your app, you don't want to see that that debug window in the middle here. It's just waste in space. So you can click that button, turn that off. You know, same thing about your you know your properties. You don't always want to look at that stuff. Sometimes you just want a nice big you know. Screen, you know, chunk of screen where you can, you know, define your, uh, you know, lay out your app or something like that. So, um, you know, that's kind of a critical aspect, you know, being able to turn those on and off and toggle that around. Uh, zooming in on the, the kind of the, the top bar here, um, from left to right, you know, you've got your kind of control buttons. You know, these are going to let you, you know, run, run your app, run your tests, uh, you know, profile it, things like that. When the app's running, you know, the stop button's going to light up. You, know, you can kill it that way. Uh, this to the right here is kind of a uh, little selector. So it, a lot of your initial projects, you, you probably won't even touch this. But uh, you know, if you pull down like a third-party project and you're looking through, you know, you'll see things here where there's you know different schemas, different targets. You know, uh, here you can see it's targeting my Mac, but you know maybe you're targeting an uh, you know an iPhone or something like that. So you can see those different targets there. Status bar, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Just shows you what Xcode's working on at the moment. You know, when you save, when you save your code, you know, you'll see that it's building here. You know, when you run your tests, you know, you'll see what it's doing to all that stuff. And then you've got these other three buttons over here. And these will toggle different modes. Um, the first one is your standard editor mode. That's what's going to get you to that classic, you know, uh, you know, three pane you know, or four pane setup. Um, and then you've got the assistant editor mode, which I think is kind of a weird name, but basically it's just it's a split view. So if you want if you want to have two views to look at something, you can go to this assistant mode, and you can say pull up uh, you know two different pieces of source code, or you can have your um, you can have your layout in one, and you can have your sort you know corresponding source code in the other. So it's kind of a side by side uh, view where you can you know look at stuff. And then the last one here is is the version control mode, and that's where you can, uh, you know, if you're using Git or something like that that Xcode supports, you can use that to, um, you know, commit stuff to your project or you know look through the history logs and things like that. So I'll show a quick uh, quick highlight of that. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is just create a new project so that we can work with this here. And um, if you've never created a project, it's pretty easy. You just file new project. And then it gives you kind of a whole slew of options here. Um, you know, the basic one that you're going to want is a Cocoa application. That's going to be your, your standard GUI. Um, if you don't want the GUI, if you're just writing kind of some, you know, utility to automate something, you know, you could write a command line tool. Uh, you can do those in Swift as well. You know, it doesn't have to be just a GUI app. Uh, the other thing that you might occasionally write would be a, a, a library. Um, so if you want to, um, uh, you know, kind of encapsulate some functionality that you have, a uh, certain feature set or something, you can put that into a framework or, or a library, and then you can distribute that to, you know, other people or consume it in other applications. So I'm going to stick with this for now. And then you just want to make sure that uh, you know, the language is set to Swift. Um, that'll get you everything you need. And once that pops up, you, we've got this uh, you know, three-pane layout that I was talking about. So using the nav bar, uh, personally, 
I found it a bit odd at first because it, uh, it works on the one click principle. And a lot of other IDs I've used were two clicks. You know, you double click something and it open it. But in Xcode, you just single click, it opens it, takes you to that. Uh, so once you get the hang of that, pretty smooth, but you can, you know, browse through all your stuff. Um, going kind of from left to right here, uh, you've got your symbol navigator, which kind of shows you some low level info about, um, you know, your project, not something you're probably going to use, especially getting started. Uh, you got search, you can search through your code, uh, issue navigator. This is going to show you all your warnings, um, errors, you know, when you go to build the code, if it fails, you know, this is what's going to come up. You also get in the status bar when something fails, a little message here. And when you click that, it's going to take you to this automatically. Uh, which one is this here? Oh, this is your test navigator. Um, so right now we only have a, the, the two sample tests that it's created. But, um, you know, you can see the test uh, and then you'll get this little pl uh, play button here, which will let you run the test. Uh, pops up next to the individual test too. So if you want to just run a single one, you can do that. Um, you know, running them is pretty simple. It'll automatically build your code, run it, and then when you come back, hopefully you'll see green. Um, so test succeeded. You can see the green check boxes. Everything's good. If something fails, you'll get a red X. Uh, this is this will pop up when you're debugging code. It's uh, going to give you some more details about the status of things. It'll show you stuff like memory usage, CPU usage. Um, I think it's got power information, all that stuff that you want to kind of to tune and you know understand what's going on in your app. Uh, breakpoint navigator. When you're stepping through stuff, you know you're going to want to add breakpoints. Uh, it's very easy. You just kind of click in this left hand menu here or left hand like gutter and pick where you want to put the breakpoint. You can single click them to enable, disable. You right click, you can delete it. And I'm not sure what that last one is there. Never used it. <laughs> uh, so then on the right hand side here, you know, you've got some, some just kind of detailed info, you know, this is kind of similar to looking at like what you'd get, you know, if you did like, uh, you know, looked at the info in the, in the finder uh, for your file. When you're looking at code, not really useful. So I'll just usually click that and uh, dismiss it so that we have more space to look at our code. If we're looking at uh, our uh, layout here, you know, then you're going to want this stuff here. You got lots of good info. Um, This uh, identity inspe inspector is going to be, you know, particularly helpful. You can click on objects here, and it's going to give you uh, a lot of detailed info about them, things that, you know, properties that you're going to want to set. Um, you know, it'll show you a lot of um, you know, helpful info there. Here, let me drag a button out here so you can see. You know, you can set the tool tip, um, stuff like that. Uh, this is another. Um, it's a. Uh, the attributes inspect inspector and uh, it's got a lot more information that you can set to you can change the style of the button you can um, you know change the title uh, you can also just click on it type 2 that'll let you change things as well uh, this uh, size inspector is uh, helpful for uh, layouts you know it'll let you um, kind of adjust the the size and the way that that component displays then we've got uh, our um, outlets. Our, it, well, they call it the connection inspector, but it's uh, it's going to show you your outlets and uh, actions, the way that they're wired up. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, you've got your binding inspector, which uh, shows you bindings. Again, we'll talk about that more later. And um, this is another one I haven't quite gotten around to using yet either, uh, but I think it's for uh, animations and things of that nature. All right, uh, I think that's good for this demo. Switch back here. So, uh, you know, building GUIs. Um, it's, it's made pretty easy for you in, in Xcode. You know, you have that, uh, uh, you know, what you see is what you get kind of editor. You can put stuff where you want it, and when you run the app, it's going to be right where you put it. 
Um, you know, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, there's obviously a lot more to that, you know, when you're consider all the complexities that go into, you know, creating a proper layout and supporting, you know, windows resizing correctly and the objects in those windows resizing as well. But when you're getting started, I would encourage you not to worry too much about that. It's more important to just get something that's functional that you can, you know, play with and adjust as you, as you get more comfortable with the tools and as you get, um, uh, you know, a little more familiar with Xcode, you can kind of pick up those extra things, refine your app, you know, make it, uh, you know, resize nicer and things like that. So, you know, don't, don't obsess over that stuff right off the bat. You know, a lot of times it's nice to just you know, get something up that's working that you can see. And then, you know, you might figure out like, you know, hey, I don't like this layout at all. I'm going to start over completely. Um, but, you know, until you kind of get something up you can play with, you know, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, under the covers, you know, you have this, uh, I think it's pronounced zip file. Um, that's uh, basically just XML. Um, but when you look at that in Xcode, it's going to show you the, the GUI. Um, essentially what it is, is it's, it's, a, it's a collection of objects that you've defined. So you're defining the objects and you're setting a bunch of properties on them. And when you load that file, uh, the, the underlying framework is going to take it and it's going to instantiate all that stuff for you. So it's, it's a quick way to just have it create all these objects and, and set everything up that you need for your app. And uh, the, if you've ever heard of the concept of, of, of dependency injection, uh, it's, it's familiar to that. You have this kind of context of, of objects that are created for you, and then you can tell the system, give me that object here, or this class needs you know, object Y. So you can wire all that stuff together, and you don't have to do that manually. And it, it saves you a lot of time, um, and it makes your apps uh, a, a lot more flexible. Um, you, can, uh, you, know, you can put objects in the, the zip file that are not just visible objects. They're not, uh, you know, just stuff that's going to display on your GUI. You know, you can have uh, other things in there as well that are invisible. And when you look at the initial project that you create, you know, you'll see some of those uh, objects too, like the controller and things like that. Um, Xcode's got, uh, uh, well, and, and through the frameworks, a huge, huge list of components that are available. Um, I don't think I could talk about all of them in the full 70 minute presentation if that's all I talked about there's so many um, it's a little daunting at first but uh, what I've found helps a lot is the search bar you know they've got a nice uh, search filter that you can use to kind of narrow down what you're looking for and uh, find those components quickly um, there's also a wealth of knowledge uh, online about you know specifics about using a particular component uh, you know, buttons, things like that are pretty simple. You know, you, you'll probably figure that out just dragging them around and, and clicking around. Uh, but, you know, when you're looking at doing something more complicated like a table or something like that, you know, you're, you're going to uh, probably need to see a specific example, walk through it a little more. And there's tons of resources for that uh, because, like I said earlier, it's all just cocoa. You might find that the examples are written in Objective-C, but you can still see how to use that component, how it works, and then just translate it to Swift, uh, which yeah, after you do a few times is, is you know, something that's fairly straightforward. So I'm definitely not going to show you all of them, but you've got your components in the lower right here. Um, you know, as you can see, as I'm scrolling down through the multitude of them, there are tons, um, tons and tons. Uh, the search thing that I mentioned at the bottom here, so if we want buttons, we can just start typing. It'll filter them. We've got all our different types of buttons. Um, drag and drop, you know, put the stuff where you want it. Go away. Um, so pretty straightforward. So one of the probably more important concepts that, that you're going to want to understand our, our actions and outlets. And the names might seem a little bit weird at first, but they, they make sense once you get to understand it a little bit. So an action is uh, uh, something that, that you're going to, to do um, based on an event. So if you've got a button and the user clicks that button, uh, you can wire it, you can, you can have an action run when that button's clicked. If uh, somebody selects an item from a drop-down menu, 
you, that's a different event, you can have something run on that as well. There are tons and tons of, of things that you can set actions to. Um, this is one of the main ways that you're going to have a nice responsive GUI. Um, you know, you attach the actions to things, um, and then that, that will get you the functionality. I'm going to show you how to do that in a second here. It's, it's pretty straightforward. And as we were talking in the Swift demo, you, this is where the function aspect of things come in. An, an action is going to map to a function. So you kind of have to understand that format of the function, what, what the action is going to give the function, and then how you can um, run the code from there. Uh, an outlet. Um, so if you recall, you know, we were talking about how the, uh, the zip file is kind of this big collection of objects that, that the system creates for you. An outlet is a way to say, hey, give me one of those objects. I need it for this class. So when the system comes up, it will see these outlets and it will inject the stuff that you need into the, the, the files. You know, so if this controller needs to access the button and a drop down menu, you can wire those in with outlets and then uh, just kind of magically access them, you know, in your code. Uh, you don't have to worry about how they get there or if, you know, what type they are or setting them correctly. It just all happens uh, automatically for you. And um, this is where the, the assistant editor or uh, split panes, I think, which makes more sense, but where this comes into play. Because what you're going to need to do is have your, your view in the left pane or the right pane, depending on what your preference. And then you're going to be dragging stuff over into your code. And uh, Xcode will make some minor adjustments to your code. And then uh, you'll see this little, I don't know if you can see this on the projector. It's kind of a light gray button or uh, a circle. And that is kind of the, the symbol that lets you know that there's a, a, an action or an outlet bound to whatever that line of code is. So it's important because I can go in and delete this line of code, but that binding for that action or outlet still exists. And so if you're not careful and you just delete the code and move on, you can see problems when you go to run your app because you've still got that binding there, but it's not going to know where to inject it because the code itself is gone. So something to be, to be uh, you know, careful about as you're you know, getting started. The uh, two, two uh, tabs that you're going to want to take a look at, or actually that's no, just one, uh, the Actions and Outlets tab. Uh, it's this kind of arrow with a circle around it. And it's going to be on the rightmost pane you know, as you're um, looking at Xcode. And uh, it gives you some, some details. So like in this example here, we can see um, where we've got some outlets bound. So we're injecting this image view. Um, and uh, it's going to our app delegate, which is kind of the main controller for our app. And so you know, somewhere in the app delegate, it's using that to uh, maybe you know, set the image or something like that. Uh, on the right. We've got an example of, of an action here. So you can see um, yeah, it's calling this go to next function to, to do something that's on the app delegate. Uh, as I mentioned before, those bindings exist whether the code that you've you know, linked it to exists or not. This is where you can delete those bindings. You'll see this little X here. If you click that, the binding is going to disappear. And um, that's how you can kind of clean that up. So, to completely remove uh, an action or an outlet that you've added, you delete this, and then you delete the corresponding part in the code. All right, so I'm going to show you real quick how we can set this up. Delete that. Add a button here. And so I'm going to close this now so we have some more screen space. And then we'll click this middle button here, which is the assistant editor. Brings up our, our split pane. That was not what I wanted. OK. And so we'll see over here, we've got the button. And if I hold the control key, click and drag, you'll get this arrow. And uh, you just drag it onto your code pane, and that's where you can control where it's going to insert that. So, you know, I could put it up here, I could put it down here, it doesn't really matter. Xcode will add the code for you. In the little uh, pop up that ensues, you've got the option. You can add an outlet or an action. 
Uh, in this case, we've got a button. We're going to add an action, and we want to make that button do something. And then uh, name is kind of what you want to call it. So do something. So you can see Xcode created this function for us. But uh, more importantly, it's got this uh, kind of annotation here of, of an action. So that's kind of what lets us know that this function is going to be called by an action. Uh, and then you can also see this gray um, button here you know, that shows that we're linked to something. You know, if I delete this, that goes away, but it's still actually linked. Oops. So if we want this to do something, we just add our code here. Um, you can literally do whatever you want. You can inline all your code here. You can, you know, import a class and use that. You can, um, you know, you call libraries, do whatever you want. There's, you know, no limitations. Uh, if we run this, in the bottom right here, when we click the button, probably help if I saved it. Not cooperating. <laughs> uh, good call. There we go. No. Let's try this again. All right, we got our button there. Bring this back up, and we see hello world. So you can just see many times as I click that, it's just going to keep executing. Um, you know, the beauty of actions is that unless the user is triggering that event, it's not doing anything. So if you've got some complicated code, you know you don't have to worry about that. The performance of that code necessarily, it's just running. You know when the user clicks it. Uh, outlets. Very similar. Yeah, you know, we could add this button as an outlet too. Uh, you just select outlet from the drop down, give it a name, connect, and then it's uh, referenced there as as a variable. And anywhere in your code, you can do that. So we could uh, say, you know, my button. You do whatever you want with it. You could set your different properties. I was looking for the text. I can't remember the name of that property. Uh, that's all right. Um, but uh, you know, you can access it just like it exists anywhere uh, in your code. So uh, that's uh, you know basically outlets and actions. I've got uh, kind of a more full-featured demo that I'm going to show here at the. And assuming we have time, I got to pick up the pace here a little, um, and uh, I'll I hope to show some some better examples of that. So bindings are are similar to your actions and outlets, but uh, it's kind of a way of of keeping things in sync. So uh, oftentimes when you create your app, you're going to have a model that behind the scenes represents you know something in your app, some state, uh, some objects that you have, something like that, and then the GUI is going to represent that model to the user. So it's going to show them a part of it. It's going to uh, you know, let them edit it, something like that. Bindings are what let you keep the model in your code in sync with what's showing up in the GUI. And so you can bind those two values together, and then the system will automatically update it. So when the user is typing in the text box, the value in your uh, uh, object is automatically changing. If you change the value in that object, the screen automatically updates. 
Um, I've got a, I was going to show a demo for that, but I think I'm going to skip it. Uh, I'll just kind of walk through briefly what you do. Um, there's a, uh, a bindings uh, on the right hand side. There's a bindings screen where you can configure. You basically tell it what to bind to. You can pick from a drop down list of, of the different objects that you've got. Uh, and then you just give it the basically the path to it. So self is saying it's on that object and I've got this config value that I'm going to bind it to. Uh, and then um, you can see in our code example, this would conf uh, it's not lining up, but uh, this would match up to this config value here. So this could be something like a slider. Uh, you know, the user is going to drag the slider up and down as he's doing that. This config value is going to update. I'm going to skip that just for interest of time here and uh, talk about some uh, libraries. So Swift is a language and the language lets you do all the basics, but it doesn't have, you know, like access to the file system. You know, there's no file object that you'd create. Uh, you know, that's part of Swift. Swift sits on top of Coco and all the libraries that it brings to the table, and that's how you access stuff. So if you're familiar with Coco, say, you know, using like NS File Manager, that's exactly what you'd use in Swift as well. So um, there's a lot of kind of nice reuse that you can get there. Uh, for those who don't know, um, Coco is kind of like a, a conglomeration of the, the, the foundation application and core data frameworks. Um, it's When you're using it in Swift, it's as easy as import Coco. Um, you don't have to do anything else. Uh, and that will get you access to all the all the goodies that it brings. You know, it'll get you stuff like file system access, network access, uh, some data stuff, uh, all the GUI stuff. You know, that's part of AppKit, uh, and even you know, ability to, to you know, audio and video, uh, you know, displaying and, and editing. It doesn't have everything though. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you know it's just not going to do for you, but uh, you know. There's a nice community around Swift that's growing very rapidly and uh, putting out a lot of open source third-party libraries. Um, I mentioned the, the tools earlier, CocoaPod and Carthage. Um, those are uh, tools you can use to, to build these third-party libraries and um, it makes it really easy to integrate with your app. Uh, the one thing about CocoaPods that is nice is their website actually has a really slick uh, search tool if you're looking for one of these libraries. Because, um, you know, they can be a little tricky to find sometimes, and uh, it just kind of lets you browse through. You know, if you want a, a JSON processing library, you can type JSON, and it'll pull up a whole slew of them for you. A <coughs> uh, couple things I wanted to highlight, because I used them in my, my uh, last demo here, is um, HTTP clients. You know, a lot of times, you know, you maybe have a front end that's going to, you know, access a web service. You know, it's going to store some data, you know, on a server for you. Um, you can do that through, you know, the, the, the Coco framework. Um, it has stuff. Personally, I think it's kind of complicated, and I think others do as well. There's a handful of, uh, I guess, different interfaces that, that are aimed to make that process easier. Uh, one of the really popular ones is called Alamo Fire, and then another one that I fairly new, but I, I kind of like, is called Just. And if you're from the Python world, Just is modeled after the, the request library in Python, so it's... Um, very nice, in my opinion, API. Uh, JSON processing. There's, you know, if you're working with uh, a uh, you know web service, you're probably going to need to do some JSON transfer. You know, write some objects to JSON. You know, read the JSON from the server. I found Swifty JSON to be you know really nice, very um, concise. I have some examples of that, and then also because everything you're doing in your GUI, you know, there's a there's a lot of asynchronous stuff that's happening, um, and the reason for that is because, you know, you can't you can't just send off a request to a web server and block the whole UI. You know, while that request is going on, the user's not going to be able to do anything. So you have these you know things that happen you know asynchronously. You know that allow the user to keep um, keep using the app while it's happening in the background, and that can get really complicated really fast. And uh, you can have some pretty you know nasty looking code. And uh, there's a kind of some, uh, I guess, you know, stylings uh, of uh, you know that are called futures and promises, and um, it's a kind of an API that you can use to help make that make asynchronous stuff easier. 
Um, and it's something I would strongly encourage you to check out. If you're doing anything more than, than a trivial uh, kind of app, you know, you're, you're going to probably want something like that. Uh, I use Bright Futures. I thought I, I liked that one a lot, but there's also a handful of them. Um, so, you know, you have plenty of choice. So I've got some other playgrounds here that I put together um, to show, and I'm not going to be able to go through them all, but uh, this stuff will all be on GitHub so you guys can kind of peruse through it, and I've tried to comment it so that you can kind of see what's going on. Uh, first one is uh, File.io, and um, it uh, walks through all the stuff that you'd want to do to access the file system. You know, read files, write files, uh, read stuff from your application bundle, uh, all that good stuff. And there's uh, tons and tons of, oh, at the bottom for some reason. There's tons and tons of examples here um, that show you how to do, you know, what I kind of figured were a lot of the common tasks. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it's all done through NS File Manager. So, you know, if you've got that uh, Objective-C background, you know, you, you should be familiar with this already. Um, I'll let you guys kind of peruse through that on your own time. Uh, there's one for JSON as well. Um, this is kind of interesting because I did kind of a side-by-side -side comparison so that you can see um, the, the kind of the, the, the built-in support for JSON versus Swifty. And, uh, you know, this is, this is how you would, um, you know, read a, a basic JSON object with the built-in support. You, know, you use this NSJSON serialization class. It reads it in. You, know, you check for an error. Uh, it's an, it's given you optional, so you know you have to do the you know the whole dance with you know if let, you know then you can actually access stuff. Uh, versus Swifty JSON, which is just this. So a lot less lines of code, and this is just for a very small you know blob of JSON here. Uh, a lot less lines of code, and just kind of a nicer uh, interface to work with. If you're talking about a more complicated example, I, I didn't even write it using the built-in stuff because it would have just been horrific. But uh, you can kind of see what Swifty lets you do. You know, you can um, you know, load in your, your JSON blob. You've got things like, you know, how many items are in it. You can, you know, index into, you know, items in a dictionary. You can just iterate it just like you would, you know, any other normal list or dictionary. Um, and uh, get the values, you know, whatever you need for your code. Uh, converting to JSON, you know, it's pretty straightforward with uh, either option. Again, Swifty JSON is a little bit simpler, I think, um, but either way is you know it's pretty easy. The only kind of catch on that is, uh, you know, what you can serialize has to be fairly basic. Um, you can check the the API docs for the exact list, but um, you know it's got to be a fairly simple object. You know, strings, maybe a list or two, stuff like that. That uh, otherwise the the serializer just can't, um, you know, doesn't know how to handle it. Doesn't know how to convert that to JSON for you. And the last one here is a, a playground I put together for networking. And um, it shows you uh, how to use a couple of the different libraries, uh, Alamo Fire, Just, and, um, oh, it's actually working. Conference Network's up, good. <laughs> it's, uh, it's hitting this HTTP bin.org website, which is basically just echoing stuff back to us in JSON. So, you know, it's going out, it's, uh, you know, going to hit some of these URLs and pull back info. Um, you know, so this, uh, I believe, is an example with the built-in support here. Uh, here's an example using basic auth. You know, it's something common that you might have to do with, like, a web, a web service. Um, posting data. Uh, and then I've got uh, basically the same set of examples, you know, with Alamo Fire and using Just. So you can kind of see the various various differences in the APIs, the way that you know allows you to work with the code. Um, if if you're not familiar with with asynchronous um, programming, uh, this kind of gives you an example here. You know where um, you know we're we're making this web request, and then this last argument here we're passing in is a is a uh, a closure. It could be a function, but you know it's just a closure in this example. When when the response comes back, it will call this automatically for us. So it, it's not going to happen right away. If the server's fast, it'll happen pretty quick. But, you know, if the server's slow, it could take, you know, five, ten seconds. 
and then this will just run whenever it's done. You know, we can look at the output, we can get the, you know, the HTTP status code, you know, and then we can, you know, pull the data in and, and do whatever we want to do with it. So, uh, where to go next? Um, Apple has lots of resources, videos. Um, they're, you know, constantly adding new things. It's, it's a very, uh, it seems like it's very important to them. You know, Swift is getting a lot of attention and a lot of resources behind it. So, you know, they've got a lot of great stuff there. Uh, CocoaPods, as I mentioned, is a really good place to find third-party libraries. Um, Stack Overflow, uh, you're just a good place to ask questions, you know, find answers to stuff that you might be, uh, you know, having trouble with. And then uh, the developer blog, the Apple developer blog for Swift, it's a pretty good place for um, you just kind of staying up to date on news. You know, they, they'll post new things they're doing and, and stuff there. So we got five minutes. Uh, questions? Uh, where can we download the playground files? Uh, it's, there's a link in the presentation. I'm assuming those are on the conference website. Um, but uh, if you want, you can see me after too. I can give you a copy on a zip, uh, zip drive or something too if you want. Any other questions? Is there a good resource for someone who doesn't have a project, like some something to follow along with just to get started and start learning? Like, um, like hey, let's build a web browser, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> because I go through some of these samples and it's like, hey, they explain everything. It's like, all right, but I'm not using it, you know what I mean? Sure. Um, I believe the that some of the Apple tutorials have like basic projects, you know, they'll walk through like, you know, making a temperature converter or, you know, something like that that's a pretty trivial example, but it'll show you some of the concepts like binding and outlets and actions and stuff like that. Um, you know, other than that, you know, just use your imagination. <laughs> Try to think of something that'd be helpful. You know, if you're um, if you're doing something that's you know painful and you're, you you want to automate it, you know, try doing that. Or if, you know, even even just silly. You know, if there's a, a yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> Build a random Swift project generator. Um, your 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 imagination is uh, you know, the only limit. So. Any other questions? So I've got like three minutes left. I'm just going to flip back and show the last project that I put together. Um, so I wanted a cool demo. I'm just going to run this so you guys can see it. It's not running, of course. Okay, well, I wanted to run that. Let me see if I have a cached copy here. Yeah, it's working. So uh, if, you, if you haven't seen it, Marvel has a, an API that you can call, and it will pull down, uh, it lets you pull down information about all the comic book characters, comics, all that stuff. So I just wanted a, you know, like an example that was a little more than trivial. And so I, I put this together. It's just kind of a little carousel thing here. You can you know, browse through and look at the different characters. It shows you a little description, picture. Um, I'll have the source code for this, too, um, so you guys can take a look at it. But uh, again, you know, I, I put this together just to kind of give a nice um, example of you know, something that's more than just the, the, the simple um, you know, stuff that you'll find online a lot of times. But uh, it just kind of gives you an idea of what you can do, you know, if you're bored uh, or just looking for a project, you know, you can do something like this too. All right, uh, 15 seconds to the music. Thanks for attending. <laughs>